Thank you for having me here at this event. Um, uh, uh, Yad Rahwan, I am based at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. I've moved here uh, just under two years ago uh, to start a new research center on humans and machines. So we're basically a group of interdisciplinary scientists, computer scientists, behavioral scientists, um, who work uh, at the, well, basically we explore questions at the intersection of human uh, behavior and artificial intelligence and information technology. Today, I'll talk to you about how to trust the machine. And obviously you could ask this question in so many different ways and there are so many angles. Uh, so there's no way I could be comprehensive, but I hope to contribute a little bit to um, uh, one perspective on how we can answer or explore this question. Um, so first, let me start with just a, a broad uh, overview of the, the kinds of decisions that uh, machines make that impact humans. Uh, machines recommend things to us uh, from news to music to all sorts of other things. Uh, they also um, help us navigate the physical world, but they, increasingly they're getting um, engaged in high stakes decisions. So for example, who gets a job, who gets a loan, uh, what kind of medical diagnosis do you get and maybe who gets healthcare as well, uh, what type of medical care and uh, of uh, there are cases where machines will be programmed to uh, make decisions that have life and death consequences, for example, in autonomous vehicles. Um, so how do we trust those machines and, and how do we know that uh, we can trust them? Um, I'm going to explore this question from three different angles. One angle is uh, before we answer the question how to trust the machine, we have to first understand what the machine can do. Uh, so we need to build a good understanding of the capabilities of the machines, of the kinds of mistakes that the machines make, the kinds of uh, performance metrics that uh, they outperform humans uh, or underperform humans, as well as all the kinds of immoral hazards that may arise. Then I'll talk about uh, questions about, well, if we understand what they can do, what ought they do, which is a more uh, normative question. And in this case, we can also explore this question empirically by uh, understanding how people's expectations of machine behavior are shaped. And finally, uh, there's a question of, well, how do we force those machines to perform, to behave as we would like them to do? And I think that's a uh, very much a kind of political science question more than anything, but again, behavioral science can add uh, to our understanding. So, so let me start with the first part. And in the first part, uh, to explore how, what can machines do? Uh, I wanted to share with you a kind of research agenda, let's call it a roadmap uh, on machine behavior. But to understand this, we need to first understand what is the nature of computer science. So you could think of computer science as math a branch of mathematics. And this would be, for example, the view of somebody like uh, Dijkstra, uh, a Turing Award winner and very famous, well-known uh, contributor to like foundation of algorithms. He famously said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And he famously did not have a computer until very late in life, even though he was uh, one of the most famous computer scientists in the world. For him, computer science was something you do on the blackboard. So you, you write algorithms, you prove their property um, uh, mathematically, and that's the end of it. But then there's a whole other tradition of computer science, uh, which is computer science as engineering. Uh, one maybe canonical person here is Grace Hopper, who is a, uh, for an admiral in the Navy in the US. She famously is attributed to have found the first bug, actual bug in a computer, um, which was, uh, I think, in a vacuum tube machine. But uh, putting that aside, uh, this kind of view of computer science as engineering is really about building machines, about testing them, about um, making sure that they operate as expected and about debugging them. Right? So it's more of an engineering practice of making things work. It's a bit like building bridges as opposed to, let's say, understanding uh, like a natural phenomena, right? Uh, more broadly. But these are two, these two views, the mathematics and the engineering view, I think can be complemented by a third view, uh, which is computer science as a science, uh, as a science of computers, meaning that, uh, meaning a hypothesis driven, uh, uh, approach to studying computers as an object of, of interest. 
um, in order to uh, characterize their empirical properties. And the person who, this is not a new idea, the person who kind of spearheaded this way of thinking is Herbert Simon, who was both you know, uh, a computer scientist and a psychologist, but also an economist, Nobel Prize winning economist. And he wrote this book called The Sciences of the Artificial, in which he contrasted natural science, which is knowledge about natural objects and phenomena, like trees and rivers and uh, ecosystem and so on, with uh, artificial science, which is knowledge about artificial objects and phenomena, things that we engineer and design, things like machines and institutions. Um, and inspired by this, we've kind of uh, resurrected this way of thinking in a paper that we wrote a couple of years ago, published, I think, in 2019, um, trying to formalize this, what we think is this emerging uh, re research field of machine behavior. And we've written this paper with a bunch of computer scientists, but also with a variety of behavioral scientists uh, from economics, anthropology, biology, psychology, and, and so on. And the idea here, so I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, it was framed as a review, but also it's a bit more like a manifesto or let's say a, a research um, roadmap. So if you think of questions like this, questions about news ranking algorithms, does, does an algorithm create a filter bubble? Now you could ask, or does it disproportionately censor certain content? Like somebody like Dijkstra would, would have said, you know, I'm going to create an abstract model of this algorithm. I'm going to maybe create an abstract assumption about how a human interacts with the algorithm. And then I'm going to prove under what conditions um, I can prove mathematically that the, the, the algorithm will not result in a filter bubble. Um, you know, in some kind of equilibrium state. And, you know, you do this proof at the beginning and then you shift the algorithm. But obviously with a very complex algorithm, it, this becomes very difficult. You could engineer the algorithm, um, you know, and test it in the, in the lab, um, like the way that let's say a lot of machine learning uh, researchers would test their uh, machine learning algorithms by validating them on, let's say canonical data sets. But again, um, I think, um, the true difficulty then comes with what happens when you deploy these algorithms in the real world. And I think this behavioral perspective to say, you know, we could explore these algorithms or uh, the properties of these algorithms completely behaviorally without necessarily understanding their inner workings um, is an important perspective because then you could study those algorithms even if you don't have access to, you don't work for the company that built those algorithms. For example, you know, it's not easy, it's not straightforward to, to ask, uh, let's say a company like Facebook to give you access to the source code of their news filtering algorithm, but perhaps you could still study it behaviorally the way you would study a, um, uh, like a natural phenomenon. Um, questions about autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapons, um, questions about like market collusion or uh, manipulation in algorithmic trading, uh, questions about com the behavior of conversational robots uh, and, and things like Siri, presumably can, you know, can be studied from an engineering and mathematical perspective, but also I think from a behavioral perspective. So behavioral science has a lot to offer here. Um, and I think in the same way that we, uh, cannot, we, we cannot necessarily certify the, that machines are ethical by studying their, uh, their inner workings, you know, we, we don't really do this with humans. You know, we, we have a rich characterization of human behavior uh, ethical and otherwise without necessarily having access to the inner workings, like the full, full understanding of how the brain works. So, um, and of course, you know, you can have this kind of top-down view, uh, looking at the brain at, at human behavior as a black box, uh, something coming out of a black box. And while you can simultaneously continue to, to strive for understanding the human brain, uh, uh, more mechanistically. So basically what we're saying, what we're saying is we need a behavioral revolution in the, in the study of machines in the same sense that there was a behavioral revolution in the study of, uh, of um, biological organisms, for example, uh, a lab mouse. Um, and, and you could think of like an algorithm as this kind of uh, lab mouse. And instead of, you know, one way you could, you could study it is you could look inside of it, you know, you could put it under the uh, uh, microscope, so to speak, but alternatively, you could put it in a box and you could subject it to experimental stimulus like temperature and then you can measure behaviors of interest like 
uh, sleep behavior, for instance. So the question is, can you put, can you create um, algorithms in kind of controlled environments? And that's in a way that what a lot of these new AI gym, uh, AI games kind of environments try to do. They, they try to create rich experimental environments in which to study the behavior of algorithms um, but for engineering purposes in this case. And if you could do this, then when people come up with different uh, proposed algorithms, you have, you have quantifiable metrics. Uh, because you've developed like good measurement techniques for measuring behaviors of interest, like like bias and so on. Um, and of course, you cannot do this uh, for individual machines only, but you should do it for uh, collective machine behavior as well as the hybrid behavior that that comes out of hybrid systems that com compose of humans and machines. And in terms of like how this field relates to other fields, it some, sits somewhere at the intersection of the engineering of AI you know, people who build AI systems and the scientific study of behavior. Uh, let's say people who study the behavior of animals or uh, ecosystems. Um, and I think it's distinct from the, the humanistic uh, disciplines that study the imp that, that kind of hypothesize about the Im potential impact of technology on society. Um, but they are symbiotic in the sense that these um, fields like media studies and science and technology studies can often uh, provide us with new practices and new scientific questions that machine behaviorists could then explore. Uh, but they can also incorporate new quantitative evidence from uh, the study of machine behavior. And finally, in this uh, article, we tried to delineate the kind of fundamental questions in machine behavior. And we built, um, we took inspiration from the uh, three Nobel Prize winners of the um, for the uh, study profounding the field of animal behavior, and in particular, Nicolas Timbergen, who came up with the four fundamental questions in biology. And we've adapted those fun fundamental questions to the study of machines in, in our paper. Uh, basically, you could ask questions about um, uh, the, the behavior of an organism, or in this case, of a machine, uh, by looking at its uh, the mechanisms that cause a specific behavior. This is called the static view and proximate view. This is the cause of a specific behavior, but you can also ask, well, how did this behavior develop? What is the dynamic view of this, this that caused this behavior? You can also think about the long-term uh, functional or adaptive value of a behavior, but also the evolutionary dynamics that led to it. In the case of machines, obviously the evolutionary dynamics are not natural selection. It's, it is unnatural selection uh, driven by market forces, and, uh, and so on, uh, maybe regulations and things like that, that basically create different kinds of selection pressures against, uh, you know, over, over the kinds of algorithms that exist in the world. Um, and we just think that this may be a helpful um, uh, analogy to draw, but also it's helpful to see where these analogy breaks down, you know, where, where algorithms and machines are kind of different. For instance, the way that machines um, can copy behaviors from others is more similar to the way culture spreads then the way genes uh, spread, for example, because they can copy themselves, uh, copy each other instantly. For example, um, you know, an, an, an autonomous vehicle could learn a new behavior and then it, you could push an update on like 1 million vehicles or at the same time, something you couldn't do uh, with biological evolution. So that was the, the question of like what, uh, you know, it, it just, it's the question of what can machines do and more like more of a research agenda uh, to try and study machines from a behavioral perspective. Now I want to move to the separate question, which is what ought they do? Let's suppose they, we understand what can they do? Uh, what should they do? And here, of course, the tradition has been um, to rely on the field of ethics and philosophy and basically normative disciplines like law and philosophy. Um, in basically suggesting ways for machines to be programmed to make sure that they reflect human values. Um, and I think that's a very important endeavor. Uh, however, I do think that we have a, there's a complementary role for understanding, for using behavioral science, and psychological science, to try and understand um, what normal people think and how we might misperceive uh, machines, uh, for example. And in this case, I, I want to focus on the case of autonomous vehicles and specifically uh, because um, adopting autonomous vehicles is potentially going to be um, a life-saving technology. 
uh, life-saving development because more than a million people die in autonomous crashes, uh, sorry, in, in regular crashes, in traffic accidents every year around the world. And this number could be, in theory, at least substantially reduced by the introduction of autonomous vehicles. So, uh, but people are fascinated by this kind of fear that um, a machine can make a decision, uh, <clears throat> a life-death decision. And the canonical example here is a very contrived one, uh, admittedly, um, <clears throat> and we'll get to that in a, in a little bit, but uh, it's an autonomous car that's about to crash into a number of people for whatever reason, but the car can swerve and, and kill somebody else on the sidewalk in order to avoid killing more people. Should the car do this? Um, and this related question is, should the car do this, uh, swerve and hurt the person in the car in order to save more lives? And there are, of course, you know, different uh, ways of thinking about this. Um, the, the, I want to talk about the social dilemma here because what we found is when we ask people what do they think in this case um, the cars should do, people, at least in the West where we um, ran the initial surveys, be, uh, strongly believe that the cars should save more lives. Um, so basically to follow a utilitarian uh, principle, ethical principle. And they believe that the cars should you follow utilitarian principle even if the car would, en uh, would end up endangering the person in the car. But then when you ask them, which car would you buy, you get a different answer. So people would say, I would never buy the car that will self-sacrifice, so that will sacrifice me, but I want everybody else to buy this kind of car, you know, the utilitarian car that looks after the public good. You know, and we call this the social dilemma of autonomous vehicles. Now, <clears throat> So basically what we've discovered is there's actually a, you know, there is an ethical question, you know, what the car, what should the car do? But there's per, arguably a more important question, which is how do you actually enforce what people think is ethically correct? It's a social dilemma, it's a dilemma of cooperation because people have the incentive to look after their own safety. Um, now, we wanted to also understand whether there are cross-cultural differences in the ethical expectations that people have and we ran this uh, survey. We launched a survey in 2016 called the Moral Machine Experiment, um, which you can go and try for yourself. And it looks something like this. So uh, basically there are, the website generates random dilemmas. It looks like this. For example, this one has a person in the car. If the car goes uh, straight, it's going to kill three people and a dog. Um, but uh, these people notice are crossing the road illegally. They're crossing a red light. Alternatively, if the car could swerve and kill the person in the car, you know, what should the car do? Um, we, luckily, we got lots of coverage from traditional media, but also from new media, uh, people like YouTubers who would uh, play this game. And, and that caused a lot of people to come and uh, uh, play the game, so to speak, and uh, give us data. Uh, the game was translated to 10 languages. We had at the time of analysis, 4 million users answer 40 million decisions and more than half a million demographic surveys. And this is the, what it looks like. Uh, we published this, uh, the results in 2018. Um, and we could see that we have substantial coverage all over the world. I want to describe the results now. And, and this, is, this is about the ethical expectations. It's not about the, the social dilemma here. He, this, what this plot shows is the probability um, is kind of the premium for being the thing on the right compared to the thing on the left. So if you take, if you average over all scenarios, um, and if you take a, a, a scenario in which there is a dog, and then you swap the dog with a human, um, or a dog or a cat, and you swap them with a human, then what's the, in, what's the increase in the probability of survival? Right, so, so how much is it more likely for a human to survive compared to a dog? Uh, everything else uh, being equal. And you could see being human is a good thing um, and, and, uh, because it gives you 60% greater probability of survival in, in an accident. This is the, the, according to the preferences of the people in the survey, obviously. Um, another one is saving more lives so he, saving human lives and saving more lives seem to be very very important factors people think you should save one more person or two more people or three more people um, this is what this plot shows and these are the rest of the 
uh, preferences. And you can see here, for example, that there are three, three big ones. So sp sparing human lives, sparing more lives, and sparing young lives are, are the three most important ones. Then you've got this kind of two controversial, one of them, you know, maybe perhaps controversial one. Uh, one is sparing the lawful, so people who are not doing anything wrong over people who are breaking the law. Um, but then, which you may not think is, is unreasonable, but then there is an equally strong preference for sparing, sparing people with higher status, you know, like a business person over a homeless person. And this is, a, this I think, highlights to us that uh, the perils of, of uh, following pure public preferences when it comes to programming ethics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, now, there was, in order to contrast this kind of empirical data with the normative approach, which is, you know, people, experts and legal experts and philosophers and so on, uh, I'm going to mention the, the, out, the report written by the Ethics Commission on Autonomous Connected Driving, set up by the Federal Ministry of Transport in Germany a few years ago. And this is the composition of, the, of this commission. So it has technical people, engineers, but also people who represent legal and religious and ethical um, uh, professions. Um, and I want to show you some of the results and how they contrast. So for example, we found that uh, humans over animals was a strong preference. And indeed in, in the case of the commission's recommendations, that is indeed the case. You know, humans should all, human life should always be ahead of animal or property life, uh, property, animal life or property. Uh, we also found that uh, people have a strong preference for saving more lives for utilitarianism, and that's indeed the case. So programming to reduce the number of injuries is justified. But when it comes to age, you know, we found a strong preference for saving young people, as you have seen, but the Ethics Commission noted that distinction based on feature, personal features, including age, are strictly prohibited. That could be, you know, you may... Of course, you know, you may, you may agree on some of those features and, or all of those features. Um, so it, it really is, it depends. But this highlights just the, the tension between the normative perspective on one hand and the perspective of the public. Um, and this is a case where potentially the uh, regulators may revise their recommendations uh, if there's a strong preference for saving children. But if there's conflict between saving, uh, you know, public uh, opinion saying we should save people of higher status because they're more valuable so to society, um, that is something that we, where we may want to side with the, with the ethics commission or where the normative disciplines may wish to dismiss public opinion. And that's, you know, that's contested territory. You know, this is a case where you know, this is a complex issue. You know, to what extent are, you know, what kind of fundamental rights should ignore the tyranny of the majority and what fundamental rights or, or what rights kind of emerge from the preferences of, of the public. It's a very complex issue, but I think quantifying public preferences is a step towards, um, it's an important step towards understanding where those tensions might be. Uh, when it comes to the law, uh, lawful versus unlawful, there's also a kind of synergy in this case between the, uh, the data and uh, recommendations. So another interesting thing, uh, is the contrast not between empirical data and the uh, normative perspective, but the contrast in empirical data between different cultures. Because we had such large data sets, we we're able to quantify the strength of these factors across different countries, and therefore measure the differences between those countries in terms of like the distance between their preferences. Uh, <clears throat> and you could run kind of standard clustering algorithms and you get something like this. You get basically a clustering of countries into three different clusters. I just want to zoom in a little bit and show you here the Western cluster, which you can see is dominated by Western countries, although not perfectly, but this is purely bottom up. You know, the coloring here is, is based on uh, like uh, expert classification from the field of anthropology. It's not by us. This is purely data. So the structure of the tree is purely data driven. And you could see that you could even see a separation where Protestant Europe kind of appears together. And you could see, uh, for instance, uh, English-speaking countries clustered together. This is the Eastern cluster. And you could see here more um, uh, Confucian countries, Southeast Asian countries, East and Asian countries, East Asian countries. You could also see a lot of Islamic countries. 
Uh, and this is the Southern cluster, which is dominated by Latin American and uh, former French colonies, for some reason. Um, and what's interesting is that Spain is not lumped with the Latin American uh, cluster, as you know, you might expect if this was uh, driven by language, but it's actually in the Western cluster next to Portugal. So, well, how you know, just to give you a sense of the differences, this is a radar plot showing the different. This is the global average of the different preferences like how much we prefer, people prefer sparing humans, sparing more lives, sparing younger lives and so on. And I just want to superimpose Germany here um, for you to see, you can see that Germans prefer uh, inaction uh, more than uh, the global average. So they prefer not to intervene. Uh, they also are more uh, in favor of human life over animal life than the global average. Um, but they have lower preference for status than the global average. They still prefer higher status on average, but, but the strength of this preference is not uh, the same strength as it is in the global, um, like when you consider the entire data set. Now I want to show you China in comparison, just so you see how different this could be, right? And this, we have a website called Moral Machine Results, which if you Google, uh, you should be able to see, um, compare any uh, pairs of countries uh, as well. And you could see surprisingly things like, like I'd say, most notably is the preference for saving younger people. So what we find is Western countries, uh, which are more individualistic, uh, pre prefer uh, more strongly sparing the younger, uh, but collectivist countries, Eastern countries, more traditional countries, uh, have a weaker preference for sparing the younger over old people. Um, and you could, you know, think, hypothesize all sorts of things about uh, why. Another surprising thing was how uh, chi in China, the Chinese data set has actually stronger preference for uh, sparing legal, legal uh, pedestrians over illegal pedestrians um, and so on, even though they, they prefer sparing pedestrians less. Um, okay, so there is an elephant in the room, which is, will this even matter? This, you know, these scenarios are so contrived. I just want to quickly address that by saying that we think of this as an abstraction. Trolley problem is an abstraction of something that is more benign. So here is what we call the statistical trolley problem. And the statistical trolley problem is really the problem of ethical trade-offs that result from very benign programming decisions. For example, you have a car. This is suppose uh, you know, you're driving this car. Uh, if you have a bicycle lane on one side and a truck on another side, you might just instinctively get a little bit away from the truck. It's just a superimposing thing. This is this huge thing uh, next to you, and you don't want to get. You know, you don't want to. You want to minimize the risk of colliding with it. Uh, but then you might be a bit more likely to collide with the bicycle, or you could say, you know, I I want to give enough room for the bicycle, so I'm going to stay away from the cyclist. So in any given scenario, there is no dilemma. It's a very benign decision. You know, when you program in autonomous vehicles, you always stay in the middle. Do you move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right? Over millions of these scenarios, you may increase one or another type of the likelihood of one or, the, or another type of accident. And you will only see the manifestation of these dilemmas in the accident statistics, at the, you know, like over a year or more. And, and I think this is the true uh, manifestation of this dilemma. And there will be many of them uh, related to where you position your car horizontally, like, uh, you know, sideways, uh, how much room do you leave in front of you versus behind you, um, how much space before, you know, do you have to see before you overtake and so on and so forth. So there's lots of small decisions that will impact distribution of risk uh, in the end. And indeed, like some of the early patents in self-driving cars have been using describing this kind of reasoning, you know, like uh, statistical reasoning about risk based on probabilities of different events and the cost, you know, whether it's like cost of life or, or financial compensation that you may have to pay or the value of information that results from different things. Um, so it's not like, a, a, I would say it's a hypothetical. Okay, so this was uh, an exploration about the human expectations empirical expectation about what, ought, what machines ought to do. Now I want to close with the third question, which is how do we make the machines do it? So how do we actually agree 
because obviously we could disagree cross-culturally, we could disagree um, about how to uh, about how to resolve individual self-interest, uh, you know, and the desire for for self-protection, with which we think is the right thing to do for society. How do we resolve these things? And I like to think of this as a political problem of regulation. Um, this, you know, the regulation of human behavior is driven by law, but also by market forces, by social norms, and by the architecture of the systems around us. And we think of autonomous cars or any other machine really as something that can be subjected to all of these things. And, and social norms, for example, are that, that we studied in the, in the model machine experiment are one example of trying to quantify what those expectations are from the machines. And um, so what I've tried to develop is this idea that um, we could start from the human in the loop uh, oversight, where a human is watching over the behavior of a machine, um, where the machine is implementing a goal that is agreed upon and non-controversial. So for instance, um, you know, we have a, an autopilot in the airplane and we have a human pilot watching the, the autopilot and ready to intervene, but we have, but everybody shares the same goal. Everybody wants to uh, land the plane safely. Um, on the other hand, in many domains now, we have uh, machines implementing decisions for which we disagree on the, on the criteria. Some people may care more about fairness. Some people may care more about economic efficiency. Other people may care more about safety. Now, the question becomes then that we have to make up our minds about what it is we want. So we have to reach agreement, political, social agreement, before we even begin regulation of the machines. So um, this is what I call, call society in the loop. So what I'm calling society in the loop is human in the loop plus social contract. It's, a, it's a make, basically the, something we've been doing uh, for a very long time. It's reaching agreement over our values um, and how to enforce those values. Now, I want going back in the con context of autonomous vehicles, I want to give you a kind of proposed solution for the social dilemma of autonomous vehicles using these kind of ideas from social contract theory. This is not work by me, it's work by uh, Josh Green uh, and others at Harvard. And it's inspired by uh, John Rawls, uh, who's a political philosopher, um, Veil of Ignorance. So the Veil of Ignorance says um, that we should design the world in such a way that we would choose to live in this world without knowing who we would be. So uh, for example, um, so behind the Veil of Ignorance, you don't know if you're going to be the passenger or the pedestrian. You don't know if you're going to be the child or the old lady. Uh, so not knowing where you, who you would be, which society would you rather live in? And John Rawls argues that if you, if, if you think hypothetically from behind this veil of ignorance, then we would want a more just society. And indeed in this experiment, so that's kind of the theoretical idea. And the experimental work that Karen Huang, Josh Green and Max Bezerman has done is they show how priming people with a veil of ignorance actually create, makes them more utilitarian. So what they do is they give people scenarios like, imagine that you uh, can support a state law that requires autonomous vehicles to swerve in this kind of situation. Is it morally acceptable for a state law to require autonomous vehicles to swerve in this kind of situation to save nine pedestrians, let's say? And then in the veil of ignorance condition, they say, you don't know which one of these people you will be, right? So you, they add this on top um, because, you know, you will be the 10th person. So you will be involved. Imagine that you will be involved in this situation and you don't know who you will be. And then they say, you know, please respond from a purely self-interested perspective. Would you want to be, which state would you want to be in? This the state that has this law or not? And what they show is that, you know, I don't want to get into like the details. They have so many conditions but, um, but basically, uh, just to compare these, to, just to show you that the veil of ignorance condition, in veil of ignorance condition, support for utilitarian responses, so response that minimizes harm, was the highest. 
And this, this was replicated in multiple studies with different um, framings. And, and I think that's a, that's a fascinating kind of uh, uh, experiment to show how the way in which we think about the problem can really alter the kind of public support um, that we get for, for different um, uh, policies, public policies, you know, by emphasizing that people should not only think of themselves as the person in the car, but they should think, you know, that I'm living in a world in which there are cars uh, programmed some way, and sometimes I'm going to be crossing the street, you know, I'm not going to always be in my car. Uh, and I think that's a, that's, that's a helpful way of, you know, and, and empirically shown to uh, increase support for something that would save more lives on average. And this is, uh, and just to kind of note that you know, driverless dilemmas are kind of unsolvable in, in, in fundamentally in any kind of like objective sense, but we face similar, similar dilemmas, for example, with these kind of bull bar, this blue, you know, this shiny metal thing that you put in front of the car has been shown to increase uh, risk to, of injury to pedestrians, uh, for example, which led to them being banned in in Europe and in the UK um, in the 90s. But they are not banned in other, some other countries, for example, in North America, I think they're not banned. And that reflects also perhaps the cross-cultural differences, right, about like what values are more important here. Um, so let me just recap. Um, the question was how to trust a machine. First, uh, a first sub-question is we need to understand what can the machines do? And here, uh, we need computer scientists, but also the machine behaviorists. Uh, the question is a lesson. What ought the machines do? We learned about abstract norms being complemented by empirical norms uh, and understanding of what consumers and citizens think and want and how this might shape outcomes. And then, uh, well, how do we make them do it? Uh, uh, human in the loop plus social contract. So we need to think about the problem in terms of politics as well, because uh, of the contested nature of these, a lot of these questions. Um, I, the, here are some of the uh, pointers to some of the papers, and I just want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators on these papers. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that was uh, wonderful. And it's no surprise that we have uh, a lot of questions popping up in the chat. So I'm just going to revert those to you as best I can. Um, we have the first one that says, should machines be unconditionally benevolent, cooperative and submissive towards humans outside of moral dilemmas where somebody must unfortunately get hurt? So you, you focus primarily on the cases where they can get hurt. So obviously looking at other cases. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this is a question about, um, like I think in a broad sense, yeah, of course, I think machines, it makes sense that we require machines to be subservient to us, that ultimately they are tools for us to use. But I think you don't have to go very far to, to recognize, you know, to, to end up in situations where different machines belong to different people and different people want the machines to do different things and they can often have conflict with one another. So. Um, I think we're already hitting this, you know, we're already, already in a situation where uh, machines are causing externalities, you know, they might optimize for one group, but then at the expense of another group, or they might uh, increase one value at the expense of another value, um, ethical value or societal value. And I think understanding those trade-offs is going to be fundamental for us to resolve be before we can resolve them. Um, but I think overall, yeah, the question is, you know, can we make sure that these things are not out of control? But it, it's not so different from like saying we want we don't want corporations to run amok, you know, or governments. Like it's, you know, we want governments and corporations and any kind of thing, any big machine we build, whether it's like a institutional machine or a physical machine, uh, we want them to be somehow um, uh, subservient to the, to the general will, if, if I could use that term. Um, I think absolutely, and I think that that's sort of, we have a, a, a question um, from Ruth Longen who says, why should we accept public preferences as guiding principles for writing our laws and technology guidelines? And I think your, your four point uh, laws, norms, you know, doesn't suggest a weighting of, of these different parameters. And I, I wonder if maybe you could add my question on top of Lewis's, uh, you know, how do you weight those different factors? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a perennial question that we already face in, oops, 
Um, in, in life in general, yeah, now we don't have uh, sharing, that's fine. I think I unshared by mistake, um, but that's maybe better. So uh, I think we, we, we're already there, you know, like we, for everything we do, we have social norms, uh, we have laws, and we have markets uh, of operating, and often there's conflict between them. So for instance, um, uh, you know, we have, we have different groups that disagree on, on public policy, and they all fight it out. And, you know, the democratic system is one way of resolving those differences. Um, and democratic systems often, um, or legislators, let's say, which are often appointed by, by governments, they, um, they sometimes ignore public opinion, but sometimes they follow public opinion. And it's kind of, there's an old debate between um, propagandist and kind of media, media scholar, uh, Walter Lippmann and uh, John Dewey. So John Dewey was, was of the opinion that, you know, we need to educate the public so that they can, you know, participate in making decisions. And that's kind of the idea of participatory democracy. They, they, they should kind of vote or you know, co contribute to all kinds of decisions at the micro level. And then Walter Lippmann's uh, argument is, well, he, you know, the, he wrote a book called The Phantom Public. Like there is no such thing as a public. Like you don't even know what this thing is. And uh, because simply we cannot know everything where, you know, the world is becoming increasingly specialized. If you talk, want to talk about medical ethics, you need to know something about medicine and about ethics. And, but then you can't, you don't have time to learn about uh, climate science and, you know, other topics. So it's really difficult. Um, and and he sa basically he, sa he says that the best we could hope for is that there are pundits who then simplify the facts to the public. And this is the role of the media. And then, uh, and then the, the, the pundits and the experts kind of fight it, you know, like gladiators on the stage. And we all just watch and we kind of could get a sense of who's winning. Um, and that's the best you could hope for. But you can't really go beyond that. And I think perhaps in this case, uh, in the case of autonomous vehicles, maybe more dialogue, right? More dialogue between experts, between different perspectives could shape public opinion. But ultimately, the, the you know, we do have uh, also like fundamental rights that are, you know, not conditional on any public opinion, right? But, but, but we can't completely ignore public opinion either, because then that would be, you know, that would be tyranny, right? So I think there's something in between that is constantly being negotiated, um, you know, more successfully or less successfully, but I don't think you could take a categorical uh, position here. The, the chat is going wild. So everything you're saying is clearly buzzing with people, but we have uh, another question that if self-driving cars were developed to act differently in different parts of the world, we would need to adapt to new social norms in driving as we travel from place to place. Is that a drawback? And I'd like to add a little, uh, you talked about static versus dynamic in, in your little uh, quadrants. And I thought maybe there might be something to think about that there's this baseline that you instill, but that they do adapt over time as well. So maybe you can... Uh, tackle those two things yeah i think uh, okay so i think i mean there's there's like adaptation over time and then a, an adaptation across like space these, these are the two questions so i think in terms of adaptation across space we already have a precedent you know uh, there are universal traffic laws you know the stop sign means the same thing everywhere in the world um everywhere in the world green means go and red means stop it, it would be very confusing if it starts flipping in some places um, and people have managed to reach agreement, but at the same time, different countries have different rules about how do you behave at, the, at an intersection that doesn't have uh, traffic lights. They disagree or they have different rules about speed limits, uh, for example, or you know, uh, what's the speed limit in a school? How many speed bumps do you put and so on? And that becomes local. So I think there's room for both like local rules and customization as well as uh, some kind of universal agreement. Uh, and I think that's totally fine. Um, and, and perhaps we could, and then, but the question is which ones, which things become uh, more localized versus not. I think safety, you know, basic safety should be universal, obviously. But then, um, you know, if, if some uh, government decides that, you know, this too many cyclists, like let's say, you know, in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, right? Uh, maybe they have a different threshold for, you know, uh, bicycle safety than the rest of the world. And maybe they put different, um, pressure on uh, the manuf car manufacturers or programmers. Um, I think only time will tell whether this will happen. Um, and I think this idea maybe is more important for other things, you know, things like 
things that, that really impact culture, you know, AI algorithms that are shaping public opinion and so on could become like an imperialistic tool uh, potentially in the future. Um, now, in terms of adaptation across time, obviously that's, a, that's another important question because um, even if you program the cars, you know, to pass the test, like let's say we, we create a driving test for cars and they pass it uh, uh, in, in the beginning and then they get, you know, allowed, but then they, they're using machine learning to improve their models, right? So they continuous, continuously improve their driving behavior in response to feedback of some sort. Uh, maybe they're improving their vision systems, uh, their ability to classify objects and so on. Uh, and this adaptation can sometimes create unexpected behaviors. So I think that's, and this behavior may or may not comply with the test. So you could potentially have to do either kind of continuous testing uh, of behavior of machines, um, like continuous monitoring uh, or occasional like uh, frequent testing of some sort. But I think ultimately you need to define what the outcomes are, right? Like you don't want cars to kill people. You don't want them to, to be aggressive drivers. And the more you know how, you know how to quantify the behavior of different machines again and, and hold it up against some kind of metrics, uh, you know, then you'll make informed decisions. And I think we're, we're moving, we're hopefully going to move to a world in which we, uh, we have good quantification of machine behavior so that we can, we know what, what they're doing and we can, we can hold them accountable. But I think importantly, we have to establish what, what we want from them. And I think that that's key. Um, I'm going to jump uh, to a question from Radu Ushkai, one of our uh, presenters from earlier, uh, which I think comes to, to this point. He says, in light of your empirical work, do you think that the top-down approach to instilling ethical principles in AI systems and social robots is bound to fail? And I assume that's what you were saying, that if you could integrate bottom-up as well through learning, maybe that's the... Yeah, I mean, top down and bottom up now means lots of things here, right? So one is the programmers are programming things top down versus allowing the machine to learn bottom up, like from, from data or from its own kind of reinforcement learning behavior. Um, so the programming itself could be top down and bottom up. And then the regulation could be top down or bottom up in the sense of, you know, like smart lawyers and, and uh, judicial uh, you know, pe people who are uh, lawmakers uh, putting the rules versus taking public opinion and kind of public sentiment as it changes, you know, as people interact with new, with new machines. I think, I think it's always good to have more perspectives and, and to combine top-down and bottom-up because uh, top-down approaches often um, miss important facts and they have, you know, their own assumptions. Uh, but also bottom up can often uh, be subject to like herding and, you know, kind of they don't see the forest for the trees. So I think it's always good to have um, multiple perspectives. Perfect. Perfect answer, right? You don't commit to either. <laughs> um, there's another question. Are there good reasons not to make machines fully explainable or transparent in, for example, driving or in some other domains? Um, it's a good question. I think... Um, Trans, it depends on transparency about what, right? I think if, if something happens, if something wrong happens, and I think it's important to know why it happened, um, you know, up, up to a point, obviously, and there's a limit uh, to the kind of maybe reconstruction or understand, causal understanding of like what, what caused a particular kind of accident. Maybe there are limits to, to that. Um, but I think, you know, transparency in general is a good default. Um, then there are questions about like, you know, should, like imagine, should we, should there be transparency about whether the car is autonomous or not, uh, for instance, right? And, and here it gets a bit tricky because what if people were more aggressive against autonomous cars because they know they're, they're, they're better at stopping, right? So I've, I've been like, I have this um, um, ca cartoon where like, you know, a, a teacher is helping, um, like teaching kids about how to cross the street. So imagine like a, a teacher tell, telling the kids, you should, you know, remember kids, you should never, you should never look before you cross because autonomous cars will always stop for you, right? So, so behavior could be different with, an, with a, like a much more capable AI, but that could teach us bad behaviors ourselves. So, um, so it gets a little bit tricky, I think. Uh, sometimes transparency alters our behavior towards the machine in ways that are detrimental to us too. 
Perfect. Uh, we have another question. Is there a reliable way to estimate the impact of the statistical trolley problem? For example, how does Google do it? Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, we have some, you know, we have a research project on, that's ongoing, which we're trying to, you know, dig, dig deeper into that question. And we're working with somebody who is uh, like an expert on accident statistics, and, and it's hard. It's really hard. Um, so, but I imagine that once uh, you have, it's, it's very hard to do with today's data and today's cards, because even though they're instrumented, they, you don't have the level of detail that you would need. But I imagine like, Companies like Google or Tesla and other companies building self-driving cars do have access to massive amounts of data about like micro decisions and their consequences. So they could, for example, and, and you know, this is a little bit terrifying, but in principle, a car company could program some, you know, could randomize their cars so that some of them get closer to the track and some of them get closer to the to the uh, yeah, bicycle. box. In order, exactly. In order to see, well, you know, what, what's the trade-off here? Like, you know, so that we can make an informed decision. And it's, you know, the question is, do we want to live in a, you know, are, is this, are we okay with this? I mean, I'm personally okay because I think it would, would be good to understand the trade-off. As long as you're not in the car next to it. Or, 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 or as long as I'm not the cyclist. So it depends on who I am. But then again, right, you, you end up with, maybe we need a social contract for that. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, perfect. So we then have a, a question asking, I think, probably about those survey questions you put out. Uh, do some of these responses vary depending on how much people drive themselves in their day-to-day -day lives, um, especially when asking about sacrificing the driver versus a pedestrian? So did you control for who yeah. you are in, in the normal mix? Yeah, I imagine they do, but we haven't studied this. So if, if whoever asked that question, please run the study. It's, it's, it would be fascinating. We'll get on it. Um, we have another question. Sorry, we, you have you're too interesting. The the chat has gone crazy. Uh, he, we have a question saying uh, not related to driving. Uh, should humans have a right to be unlearned by an AI system, similar to say the right to be forgotten by Google search engine? Okay, so sorry. What should be uh, unlearned? I assume the point is that if you have been part of the data in a sort of bottom-up yeah. machine learning uh, yeah. algorithm. Should you have the right to opt out to being uh, one of the data points? I think that's oh, okay. Point. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, good, good question. I think, you know, I, mean, <laughs> I think anonymized data, you know, could may, may not necessarily be problematic in this context because I imagine the cars, it would be useful for the cars to learn you know, and, and improve safety, you know, like your, your data point is contributing to public safety in this case. Um, now, if it's, but if the car is kind of identifying me, if it's like, you know, it's also plausible, you know, with today's like facial recognition software, you could maybe identify people, map their mobility and so on. And then I think, yeah, privacy concerns are very valid. And, and I think the right to be forgotten or might maybe not even remembered in the first place is, is uh, could be reasonably expected or should be enforced. Uh, but I, I don't have like, you know, I think it depends. I think you do a lot with without having to even classify or figure out who these people are. And I think you could do a lot without needing to know, you know, this was like Iyad's car that behaved this way because, you know, I, maybe I don't want to reveal my own uh, like personal, uh, like where, where I live and where I work and so on to other people. Um, so, I, yeah, I think the usual trade-offs between privacy and utility, I think, apply. Yeah, he had some examples, sorry, that I completely did yeah. not see. Uh, like, please forget what you have learned about my purchasing behavior, or please forget that you have learned that I'm not a particularly nice person. I will be a better person going forward, which <laughs> I think is <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I think you spoke to that. Uh, yeah. Oh, he has, one la he has one last question. Uh, so I will give him that. Um, what will be your next big research project after self-driving cars? If you're allowed to let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, the, the problem with this, I, I think with my projects, I, I don't know which one is going to be the big one. So I just, I just have lots of little projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I think stay tuned. I'm really interested in the, uh, how machine behavior impacts human behavior. Um, and for example, how machines could create temptation, you know, in us. 
So obviously, you know, people talk about machine ethics, you know, is the machine ethical or unethical, but they don't often talk about how a machine could corrupt us. And I think that I find this topic really fascinating because, you know, when in human human interaction, if we interact, you know, with good people, keep good company makes you a good person, right? Because you don't learn bad habits, you don't, you're not tempted and so on. But, you know, your parents always teach you to keep, you know, stay away from bad apples and, you know, uh, bad company would corrupt good uh, good morals and so on. And I think, you know, we have, so we have a paper coming up, which is more like a review paper, which should appear, I don't know, in a month or two, um, titled Good Machines Corrupt, uh, sorry, Bad Machines Corrupt Good Morals. And it's trying to kind of classify the potential ways in, like create a research agenda of the potential ways in which machines can corrupt us. Sometimes they corrupt us because they like, they tempt us, they're like a weapon. You know, like before I could write one nasty email. Now I could have a bot, you know, a bunch of bots like writing 50 nasty emails to people. So they kind of scale my ability to harm people and it makes them more harmful. Um, but maybe, so that's kind of AI, AI as a weapon, but you could also imagine AI as a, as a role model. Maybe, they, maybe I'm doing something and then I see an AI uh, uh, tweeting and getting more followers because it's kind of more aggressive. And maybe I could learn this aggressive behavior from a machine too, right? So that so there are different ways in which machines could influence our behavior or corrupt our behavior, and I th that's that's one thing that I'm fascinated about. Well, you you took it, you it, took the words out of my mouth because we were basically you know as part of our title was the human computer interaction and it's bi-directional. So you you've sort of caught up on on one of the major themes of this uh, social bridges. I'm going to leave it there because we've taken enough of your time.